Welcome to High Society with Paxton Quigley. Folks, it has been a long time coming, but the great state of New York has finally approved legalized adult use cannabis. It's known as the Marijuana Regulation and Tax Act, or MRTA, spelled M-R-T-A. On March 31st, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signed the historic marijuana legislation bill. I shouldn't say legislation bill, legalization bill that was presented by Democratic lawmakers and supported by a wide range of supporters and also social justice reform advocates. This historic law was a result of the culmination of extensive and at times tense negotiations in the state capital of Albany. Now, the law will allow people to possess up to three ounces of marijuana and also grow a limited amount at home. And we'll find out what limited really means. The measure will also expunge the convictions of people whose offenses would not have been a crime under the new law. So with us today to talk about New York's much lauded legal marijuana program is David Holland. He's a New York-based litigation attorney, executive and legal director of Empire State Normal, and president of the New York City Cannabis Industry Association. David Holland will tell us more about the MRTA, the MRTA, how it changed over the years, why it languished, and why New York's legal marijuana program will be among, shall we say, the best and most socially equitable in the country. David Holland, welcome back to High Society with Paxton Quigley. And the first question I want to ask you, did you and your colleagues celebrate on March 31st? Well, let me tell you, Paxton, first of all, we celebrated, but it's even greater celebration to be back with you to talk about all that happened. So Oh, was, thank you very much. Um, thank you. So uh, you must be elated, right? Um, it, this is something that's taken years and years and years. It has. Uh, you know, this has only been 50 years in the making, as they say, since the Schedule One still exists at the federal level, but at least New York has finally come to its senses and has legalized it, uh, both for medical and adult use. It's wonderful. Now, first, David, do you have any idea how long it will take to, to roll out the whole legal program. I'm, I'm hearing the, the uh, it, it might take longer than we think. Uh, do you think it'll happen in 2020? Is, is there actually a, a timetable or could this, could this be prolonged you know, into 2023, 2024? What do you think is the timetable? Well, nobody's quite certain yet. They're still forming the Office of Cannabis Management and what will be the Cannabis Control Board that really runs that program. Uh, what we do sense is that New York has 10 registered organizations. They are the medical marijuana providers, um, and they are fully, inter uh, fully uh, verticalized. So they are from seed to sale and processing. They handle it all. And they will be given special dispensation to enter into the adult use market to some extent. And I believe they'll be given a head start to start already selling at the recreational level with, I would imagine, within a matter of months, um, while the program still assembles itself and gets together what it will do for licensing and for other operators, uh, both big and small, to enter into the license space. So I think 2022 oh. is when you'll see that first, maybe a little bit early, but 2022, you'll see it. Okay. Uh, do you think it'll be like January 1st or something like that? So that, that'll that be a big deal for people on New Year's Eve? <laughs> well, let's hope it's that. Uh, certainly the medical operators can be selling long before then because they already are up and operational. Um, the other uh, aspects of what it will be to get a license and where that's located, I think that's going to take longer than January, to be honest. But You'll see the okay. ability to buy recre at, at the adult use level. I believe you'll be able to see that in limited opportunities around the state within a matter of months. From the now, will providers. they have to get, get a, a special card or can they walk right in to a, to a dispensary? Now that it's adult use, no, is necessary. It's if you want to be a consumer, you're welcome to walk in uh, and, and purchase up to the three ounces that you're allowed to carry back out with you. Okay. Well, three that, ounces of flour. And, I'm sorry? That's important. 
It's you very don't have important. to go through the state because I know uh, in uh, Florida, where I am, um, you, you've got to get a you know a special medical marijuana card. And that's the difference right there is whether it's for a medical condition or not. At this point, you're able to continue with anonymity, which you didn't have just two, three, three days ago. Uh, so you can return to a lifestyle where you don't have to be on record with the state about your cannabis use or the reasons why you engage in it. So I oh, think that's, that's really that's important. An improvement. Yeah, yeah. Now, I know that you and all of the people involved in, in trying to get the, the passage, there was an, really an ambitious social program, uh, you know, that included uh, that you wanted to have the participation of minorities, women, and even disadvantaged farmers. Um, uh, how did that come about? And also, uh, another couple of questions, uh, details on expungement, as well as who qualifies as a social equity applicant. So, yeah, and those are great questions. I think you partly provided some of the answer to your second question first, which is social equity applicants, uh, the goal of the program is to try to address the harms of the drug war. So it's going to be take those people that were over persecuted and over prosecuted and try to give them an opportunity as first entrance into the market. So it will be people from neighborhoods that have been decimated by the, the, the over-policing. It will be people that have been given criminal convictions that now will be expunged because they are legal under the law as it stands today, having just passed for adult use. Uh, it will be, like you said, disadvantaged farmers. It will be uh, uh, minorities, women, and business owners trying to get really those folks that have not had all the same benefits and opportunities to enter into a job marketplace or a business marketplace um, to get them prioritized for first entry in. And the expungement issue, which means that all the records, not just your criminal conviction coming off your quote unquote record, your paper record, all of the records related to your arrest need to be destroyed. So you'll go back to being anonymous and the system blind to your prior interaction. That's the goal, and it will take some time, but you're talking millions of arrests and, and hundreds of thousands of convictions, if not more. So it will take some time, but that is a great opportunity to put people back on an even footing, and that's what it's all about. Now, what happens, let's say, if you live in uh, Michigan and you come to New York City and you're going to be with your relatives and uh, you want to go out and buy some marijuana, will you be able to do that? You will be. There, there should be no bar that I have seen to any out-of-state um, uh, purchase at all. So it should be uh, completely seamless. And there should not be any reason I can think of that you'd be asked for identification to prove where you're from. Okay, well, that's important for people to know because a lot of people vacation in New York City and uh, don't want to take anything on a plane or anything like that. Now, what about licenses? Do you, you know, in the past, there have been very few, uh, a significant number of licenses. What is going to happen with licenses? I think that that's what's going to be determined by the Office of Cannabis Management. Um, there are different classes of licenses. So, there will be some, what will not be allowed, which exists in the medical space, is that full verticalization where you can have from seed to sale. Um, you can either have a, a, a grow license and a processing license or processing and a retail license, but you can't ever have uh, the, the seed and the growth of the seed and the sale owned by the same people. So oh, it will be very... micro businesses. There'll be a lot of licenses in between the goal of which is to create lots of employment opportunities for different people and to be business entrepreneurs within the chain of, of commerce. Okay, do you think uh, that a lot of the so-called big companies are gonna go into New York City or will there be some cap on that? Well, I think there'll be a, a concerted effort by the state. They've already reserved 50% of the licenses to social equity applicants. And uh, one of the things that I believe New York is going to be very committed to, uh, and I think we'll see this from the Office of Cannabis Management, is that a social equity applicant who receives a license may not be able to sell that license for a period of years so that you don't have just a bunch of front people out there and flipping a license for immediate profit and then it gets put into the hands of the out-of-state operators and the big conglomerates. Um, I think that there really is a commitment to the little guy has to have a, a place in the marketplace, and this is how they're going to do it. 
Well, this is this is all so interesting. Now, this we're not going to have a lot of freedom in terms of growing our our own weed. Um, for example, um, can people in, in in New York City now grow their weed on 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 their on their terraces, or can they grow them on their windows? Uh, what will that be like? I mean, is, is this going to be <laughs> a whole different situation now? It is. Well, you know, surprisingly, so this had been a bone of contention for the last couple of years. This is the third time that both the legislature and the governor have put together propositions or uh, for, for, you know, for a vote. And home grow, as they call it, cultivating your own had never been part of the governor's plan. He never wanted to have that. And so part of the negotiation process was actually to allow that. So under the new law, uh, adult use, anybody over 21 can grow th six plants. Three can be mature and three are immature. And a total of six plants for, uh, per household. Uh, I'm sorry, 12 plants per household. Three, three, six mature, six immature total, no matter how many people reside in the house. Um, I would expect that they'll put in safety issues that it can only be in a certain size locked closet, not available to households with children and things like that. So it may not be on your windowsill, but it may be growing in your closet. It may be growing in your basement. Um, but there is an exception now uh, that I was surprised to see that home grow will be allowed in New York. In terms of negotiations, uh, what were your most difficult negotiations to have with the state in terms of, of you know, legalization? Well, I wasn't in direct negotiation with the state, but, you know, we lobbied very hard with different representatives, um, making clear from normal, you know, that home grow was a critical element and that we wanted much more transparency from the governor as to not only how the Office of Canvas Management was structured, but the people through their own representatives having a say and a representative from them rather than hand appointed by the governor. Uh, wanted much clearer indications about how the revenue monies were going to be spent, which the MRTA gives in much greater detail, uh, earmarking it for special uh, uh, distributions. So on the whole, those were, that took three years to be able to get it here. And I think that not only are we driven by the financial times that we sit in, um, but there is no longer a tolerance for some of the rampant um, um, abuse of the law enforcement aspects of this to continue. And I think that we are seeing a lot of this on the heels of Black Lives Matter and particularly the George Floyd and the other issues that came along this year, showing the inequities of what law enforcement has been like for people of color. And the arrest rates speak for themselves. Uh, you know, over a million arrests in New York City in 20 years and 87.5% of them were all people of color. So I think you're seeing all of that coming to bear through the advocacy of normal and other organizations that were very vocal about why this is so important. And I think it finally got heard. And I even think the governor, uh, whatever his own personal reasons might be in light of his political situation, I believe he realized that, that finally these voices of the, particularly the black community saying enough is enough. I think he took that to heart and he decided that one of the ways he can at least fix some of the inequalities um, is to do this, is to pass the MRTA. Now, do you think because New Jersey legalized that uh, Cuomo was really worried that uh, all the New Yorkers were going to, you know, go across the bridge uh, and buy their, their marijuana in New Jersey and, and um, you know, New York would not uh, get much benefit out of that? Do you think that played into uh, his mind? Well, I think that's certainly a, a factor, both politically and, and otherwise. So you have already Massachusetts that people are going to with regularity. Um, people will start going to Jersey as that plan rolls out. Connecticut and Pennsylvania are talking about uh, legalizing in the very near future. And Vermont had decriminalized and, and is now going to go to a commercial market in short order. So we're surrounded by legalization states. So there is, and, and those people that are going to those states are traveling across New York roadways. So all of that revenue lost to New York is, is a big thing. But the legacy market, the market has existed, you know, there will be a, a, a big group of people that will continue to buy from the underground until you make it available in their neighborhoods and more convenient. So those are all factors that have to be figured into it. But I think those did propel the governor to become a strong advocate for let's make this happen. Well, that's, that's good to know. Now, 
I know that in California, I used to live in California, uh, there were a number of uh, cities that opted out of any uh, cannabis activities. They said, you know, no, no, no stores, no dispensaries. What about the ability of communities to opt out of cannabis activities if, if they choose to? I know that in uh, California, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, cities that said no. Uh, what would happen here in, uh, in New York City, for example? And uh, will delivery be allowed? Because I know in California, it's a very, very good business. Well, this is one of the great aspects of the negotiations that took place because the governor, under his proposals for the last three years, uh, wanted to leave it so that the counties uh, could opt out and therefore the little municipalities within it had no say. Um, and so that got negotiated over the years, and now each municipality, town, village, city can decide its own destiny. So that's wonderful, and, uh, and that will be uh, location by location. Um, and in answer to your question, yeah, delivery services are going to be allowed, which is how the commerce has been running from the underground market already. So there's a lot of infrastructure there. Uh, transitioning those people from the underground to this market is going to be where it's a little bit more complicated because there's no straight pathway for them, but I'm sure we'll come up with ways to do that. Uh, but delivery um, and social consumption spaces, we will actually have places that you can go to and can consume. There won't be tobacco or alcohol there, but nonetheless, it will be that you can have a social safe spot to engage in, in cannabis consumption uh, that doesn't have to be on a sidewalk or something like that. Um, so that's also a big step in progress. So are you saying, uh, will there be so-called legal bars where people can uh, inhale restaurants? That uh, It will be bars. Uh, well, it will be like a bar. It will be a social place that you can go to. Um, and so that still needs to be fleshed out a little bit by the Cannabis Control Board and the Office of Cannabis Management. But other things that came up, pop-up shops. So you can have a pop-up license where you can hold a cannabis event. So if you're having, you know, a kiosk at a trade show, uh, you might have cannabis consumption there. And as long as it's in an area that you're otherwise allowed to smoke tobacco in, you can do cannabis as well. And there'll be catering licenses. And we all know that cannabis cuisine is a big, big thing. And that's being allowed too. So really there is a very dynamic rollout of all the different areas to engage with cannabis should you choose to. And, uh, and that's all part of it. Now, are you saying that in the Jacob Javits Center, there could be an area where people could go and uh, uh, smoke marijuana and that would be okay? If there's an area where you can smoke tobacco within it, which I don't believe exists, but outside of it, 100 feet from the doorways, I believe you can. But there may be a kiosk or a pop-up where you might end up having potentially vaporization, though that is uh, questionable. Certainly edibles would be allowable um, to the extent that other foods are allowed to be sold. So uh, under special licenses obtained, you will start to see cannabis become a regular part of any other event, just like you see the, you know, the Zeppeli guys that sell the fried dough and, and other things at trade shows uh, and street fairs. You're going to see this pop up as well. Now. I know that there were a number of a lot, and shall I say a, a number, not a lot, of Republicans that were against uh, the whole uh, change. Uh, are they still angry, or what? What are they thinking about this? Well, you know, I, I won't say it's strictly a Republican issue, but there are a lot of people that are still swayed by their constituents. They're made up of law enforcement and PTA members and and teachers unions. And, you know, those are groups of people that are welcome to their own opinion, but their opinions are often based on distorted facts, um, false conclusions based on statistical analysis and so forth. Um, as much as normal and other groups have spent a lot of time over the years debunking those myths, and that is what has allowed, I think, legalization to happen is that those very efforts of normal and other groups getting through to these politicians. There are still those that are going to believe what they want to believe, and there are still those that are going to answer to their constituents because they want to get reelected. So um, angry is, it may not be the word, but defeated is certainly what they are. Yes, defeated. Now, I understand that eventually, I don't know, in, you know if it'll be in one year, two year, three years, the, the industry could bring in $350 million annually. 
uh, how did you come, uh, I shouldn't say you, but how did that figure come by? And what will they do with all that $350 million? Well, you know, it's revenue. funny. It sounds Taxes. like such a, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No. It sounds like such a staggering amount and it's trivial. Um, this is a multi-billion dollar business already running through New York. It just happens to be unregulated. Um, the 350 million is what they anticipate as steady revenue. And it's what they're going to cap the revenue stream at that they're going to reinvest into the communities and education and, and uh, uh, drug, uh, uh, drug policy related things as well as healthcare uh, initiatives around drug policy. And uh, in, re in reality, just not arresting people in, we'll take New York City, all five boroughs and Buffalo. Let's just take those two. I'm quite certain just by not arresting people, you'll save $350 million. So it's an infinitesimal amount of money as compared to what's going to be generated if you think about all the people that now will be able to um, earn an income and pay rent on their homes and be able to pay sales tax and they will buy and lease cars. They'll send their kids to school. So that trickle of effect of a new economic resource in the community will have billions of dollars of outflow as a result of it. So to me, $350 million sounds like a lot. You could save that in a police budget easily. Oh. Uh, you can, so, just by not arresting people, you can save it in a police uh, budget. So what will happen to all of the so-called illegal guys out there uh, that, that, that sell, you know, bags of, of marijuana to people? Will that go away or will that still be around, do you think? Well, you know, much like prohibition with alcohol, you know, it wasn't all that long a time period before finding, uh, you know, a, a quart of bathtub gin was pretty hard to come by. Uh, I think that you'll find a lot of legacy market operators being able to transition in because they may qualify under social equity and other provisions. But there's going to be a group of people that I feel terrible for that I am advocating for. Uh, there needs to be some level of clemency or other way for a pathway for them to come into the marketplace if they don't otherwise check the boxes of those people being prioritized to get to the market first. And that's, a, that's going to be a problem. Interesting. Now, let's uh, um, talk about the future. When do you think there will be federal legalization? Well, despite the setbacks that I think Joe Biden let down a lot of people recently with the firing of the five employees at the White House because they had admitted to cannabis use, I think that you're less than 18 months from federal legalization because we've just seen New York just went legal in the same week that Virginia did and New Mexico 24 hours later also put a bill on the governor's desk. So now you're at, you're, well, you're, you're at I think 18 or 19 legalized adult use states, but that may bring us to 40, I believe that have overall. So 40 of your 50 states have a cannabis program despite the federal illegality, despite federal prohibition you could get a constitutional amendment to drive it out of existence, the Schedule One status of the Controlled Substances Act, or you know, Congress can finally come to its senses and quit trying to create these temporary Band-Aid solutions like the Moore Act and the SAFE Act that would allow you know, banking to continue, just pass an act of Congress to deschedule it and that's it and everything else will fall into place. So I think that's 18 months. So what is going to happen now with National Organization to Reform Marijuana Laws? Because for, for me, uh, I believe so strongly in the organization because without normal, uh, none of this would have ever happened, in, in my opinion. Uh, so what is the future of normal? Well, let me let me go back to its roots for a second to say without Keith Straub, who founded it, and Michael Kennedy, who who helped keep it alive. And when he was giving support through high times and high times and normal bonding together 45 plus years ago, we never would have seen this day come in any of the states. So the whole movement owes a lot to those two individuals. Um, with that said, Normal, you know, it's funny, it's achieved its objective in that it, it, it's not only, uh, you know, reformed marijuana laws, it's actually legalized it. So we've gone that next step. It's going to become a very consumer centric um, organization. It will look at not only issues like product safety, but consumer options and things of that nature. And we'll continue to advocate 
uh, on those causes and hold, I would imagine, trade shows and things like that. Um, and part of that reason is why I formed the New York City Cannabis Industry Association and its cousin, the Hudson Valley Cannabis Industry Association here in New York, because uh, rather than advocating solely for consumers, we are really creating the dialogue with what I call the underground, the above ground, which are the people getting the licenses now and the moral high ground of people that want to say that this should never be allowed. And we're trying to start and stimulate the conversation to lay the rules of you know, what the rulemaking and the administrative functions should look like for the industry as an industry and, and, and really trying to gather data from everybody in it. Because the last thing that the legislators in Albany have any familiarity with is the actual cannabis industry itself, how it runs, how the underground market runs. And the underground market is the biggest in the world. It is efficient. It has its own rules that govern it. And unless until you learn how to adopt and adapt to that, um, the legalized market is going to have a hard time getting off the ground. So clemency is something that I'm looking forward to. So that will be something I believe normal will be behind also is let's let all those people that were once outlaws become the in-law track to a better legalization program federally. That's, that's terrific. Uh, that's really positive. Can you please give our listeners uh, how they can uh, read more about NORML? Oh, sure. So uh, NORML as a national organization is N-O-R-M-L dot org. And for New York, it's Empire State NORML, N-O-R-M-L. There's no A in that dot org. And also you can look at the New York Cannabis Industry Association is N-Y-C-C-I-A dot org. And you can find out about all the things that are going on in New York and nationally through those, those links. Good. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, hopefully we will be uh, talking again in, in the next couple of months about what's, what's new out there. And, and we'd love to have you back on the air. Uh, it's been a pleasure, David, that you've been able to give us such, such uh, good information. And I know that our listeners will, will certainly appreciate it too. Well, and it's so, been my honor. And I thank you for that. And uh, um, shall we say we'll, we'll see you soon. And, <laughs> uh, and, and again, uh, congratulations because uh, the organization certainly deserves it. Uh, folks, this interview with David Holland and all of our shows can be heard on Apple, Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, or wherever you listen to your broadcasts, including CannabisRadio.com. And I'd also like to thank our listeners who've purchased my latest suspense novel. It's called Just Try Me, and it's available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. So listeners, stay safe, wear a mask. I think we still have to wear a mask and get vaccinated when your turn comes up because we are going to beat this virus if we work together. I'm Paxton Quigley.